So first, first we'll start with the Torah part of it, and then we'll get to the current events. Okay, so obviously this week we have Parashat Menaglim, the Parashat the Spies, and we have uh, we have the spies saying something very uh, Moshe Yehoshua. The spies they're all centered around a very specific idea. If you look at Yehoshua and Caleb, they're insistent. Look, look at the lines they, they say, Hashem, It says, If Hashem wants, Hashem could bring us back to the land. He could help us capture the land. It's all dependent upon Hashem's abilities. Whereas the spies and the people are saying, no, we're not going to be able to capture the land. They're too strong for us. Right? We have this basic debate. Later on in the parasha, when Hashem gives them the punishment, and Hashem says, okay, you are not going to get the land, but rather your children are going to enter the land. Right? None of them are going to get it. And earlier he says somewhere, but the children are definitely going to go in. And then that leads to, oh, here it is. Uh, the, the, your children, they're going to win until you die. And it says, and then finally, at the end of the parasha, we have this little interesting idea about the Ma'apilim who assume it's their destiny to go into the land and they go, Moshe tells them, Al ta'alu ki in Hashem bechem, and they go anyway to the land, they don't care, and uh, they end up dying. However, we read this parasha, and the sense we get is that there's some form of, uh, to, to borrow a different term, some form of manifest destiny the best way to put it. The Jewish people are going into the land. It's just a matter of time, how it's going to play out. That's why the next parasha begins, When you're going to enter the land that you deserve, that I'm going to give you. And we read this parasha, parasha shelah, and we get, we get saddened that the uh, generation that was current didn't take the opportunity to go into the land right away. But at the same time, we say it's very clear from the parasha, you're, you're going to enter, you're definitely going to go in. That's going to be automatic. Don't worry about that. You're going to enter the land. It's just, it's just, it's just a matter of time. This is what Am Yisrael, they're going to be in the land of Canaan. What's interesting is that it makes no reference whatsoever to the people who are living in the land at the time. What do I mean by that? They mentioned that there's the Kna'ani, that there's the Emori. But what I mean is that it seems almost obvious that if the Jewish people have Hashem on their side, they deserve to enter the land. They're going to go in, and there's nothing that these people can do to stop it. When I say they can't stop it, that includes any form of that includes any form of uh, warfare, but it also includes seemingly any form of religious something to in order for them to stay in the land. There's no teshuvah that they can do. It's decreed upon them that the Jewish people are going to capture the land. That's what it seems to be when we read the story. It's a little bit odd because if we're talking about a system of justice in the world, it should be that God is acting in a just way, there has to be another part of the story. It cannot just be the Jewish people are walking into a land that God is giving it to them 
because they deserve it, but rather there has to be something deeper at play. This idea is already hinted to, there's two, there's two commentaries of Rashi I'm going to show, show you. One of this week's Isn't it parasha, Bereshi, Why does Bereshi not begin with mitzvot? It begins with creation of the world to show that it's Hashem's world and he can put everyone where he wants? Yeah, that's, what, that's the first comment. I'm going to show you one in the parasha, but yes, correct. Seemingly, this is the first commentary of Rashi, right? That why does the Torah not start from the mitzvot? The Rashi answers, what does that mean? Oh, you stole the land of the seven nations. The Jewish people are going to respond. Hashem is owner of all the land. He gave it to whoever he so chose. He created it. It's his will to give it to them. It was his will, his will to take it from them and to give it to us. So we need to understand this Rashi. Because this Rashi seems basically, it's possible to interpret this in a sheet that this means God giving the land there's a sense of arbitrary. He liked them, then he didn't like them, he wanted to give it to somebody else, changed his mind, takes his present back, and gives it to a new person. Almost as if God, you know, couldn't make up his mind. There's no sense where it doesn't seem to be that we're talking about a sense of some form of justice within this statement of Rashi, the statement seems to be God could do whatever he wants, and therefore nothing matters. Which is almost the impression we get from this week's parasha. That's why I want to show you, I think Hahamim were bothered by this, and there's an interesting statement by Khalid in this week's parasha. When the Jewish people complain, he says the following, we could go, we could go capture the land. It's very good. Have faith in Hashem. And he says as follows. Sad silam me'alehim. Their shade has been removed. Vadunai itanu. Hashem is with us. al Don't fear them. Their shade has been removed and Hashem is with us. The rabbis, bothered by the statement, that she brings it down, explains as follows. What is the shade that we're talking about? The shade is their protection. What's their protection? The kosher people amongst them died out. Who is that? We get an example. Yov Shahayab Magin Alehim. Yov who was protecting them. So all of a sudden we see here in an interesting sense that Yov, if you're talking about him protecting the people, we get this impression that there is some form of zechut. There is some form of merit that even the people, the non-Jewish people living in the land of Canaan were capable of having. And Eov had to die, and now things are possible. This is something similar. It's a similar refrain in the statements of Hazal. They talk about it with Metushelah, that God waits to bring the Mabu until Metushelah dies. It's a prayer that we say on Mondays. And Emuna Avadu, Ba'im Chulah Ma'asehim, talk about these certain people who have the capability of protecting us. And so too, the people of Canaan had that, that someone to protect them, even though it seems to be they weren't worthy. But I like this statement because already it introduces us to the concept that there is merit and there is a sense of justice. The same way we talk about it on behalf of the Jewish people, so too we're talking about it now on behalf of non-Jewish people in the land of Canaan. So I want to show you a couple of Pesukim 
that I think are important for us to keep in mind as we read these stories about what exactly God's plan in the world is and how it operates. It's something I don't think we notice too much, and we'll come back to that Rashi a little bit later in order to explain it better. So we'll start off in Vayikra Perik and Vayikra Perik he gives us a whole list of forbidden relations, right? So you have here, here's a whole list of forbidden relations, but look how it's introduced. And this, I think, is very important. Don't follow in the ways of Egypt, the land that you lived in, and don't follow in the ways of the land of Canaan, the place I'm going to grow you to. There's something inherently wrong with the acts that they do. That's our introduction to the forbidden relations. We get a whole list of forbidden relations. Rabbi, then, we see this even earlier with Abraham trying to find a wife for Yitzchak when he's not allowed to find a, a woman from Canaan. Uh, we, we'll, we'll get to something better, I think, from Abraham. And it's funny, it's funny you mentioned Abraham. I think there's a much better pasuk. We'll see in, we'll see in, a, in, a, in two minutes. Okay. All right? And the Torah says, it says it very clearly here. Well, don't defy yourself in any of these types of prohibitions. This is how the non-Jews who I'm sending out of the land, this is what they did. And therefore, and I, 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 it was time for a judgment of the sins of the people of the land, but and therefore they got and kicked out. And you make sure to not do what they did. All right. And the Torah actually says the same thing that happened to them can happen to you. All right. That standard of justice that God attributed to the people of Canaan, God is also making as equal for the people who are going to inherit the land, the Jewish people. And they could also get kicked out. It's fair game. There's no difference between the two. The same laws apply. They violated these laws. So I'm asking you, don't violate these laws. I'm holding them as an example of what can happen to you if you don't follow these laws as well. Their time is up independently of yours. And I'll get to a better proof right now. So here, uh, uh, this is where the first time we have it in the Torah explicitly stated. But people always focus on something else. We have Brit bin Abitarim. We have the famous statement that Hashem tells Avram. Avram Okay, so everybody talks about, oh, your, your children are going to be in exile and they're going to be enslaved for 100 years. And everybody kind of stops there. Maybe they stop, stop at the next line. Okay, you're going to die. The slavery is going to start after your lifetime. So they try to figure out what's that fourth generation that's going to return. And now, look at this. Here's the key. Ki roshalim avun ha'imori adhina. If you're asking why we need to wait for so long, the Torah says very clearly, explicitly, these people's sin is not yet complete. I can tell you, based on the way they're going, and if they continue to sin, this is what's going to happen to them. And therefore, I'm promising you, you'll come in their place, and they're not going to have 
Nevi'im, they're not going to have a society that has the capacity of correcting themselves. So that's why they're going to get they're going to get destroyed. But whatever happens to them is their own basic failures to follow God's will, God's law, and therefore they're getting exiled. You're entering only when they're comp- they're finished. And God is saying, I, 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 this, it's telling Abraham, listen, there's going to be a time where I'm going to have to make some change in the way the world is being run. And that's when I'm going to stick in your children into the land and I'm going to start developing them only when the sin of the Imuri is fulfilled. And if the implication is any, uh, this comment we saw earlier from Rashi is any implication, it could be that even after the sin was fulfilled, people maybe know they still have protection from you. All comes Kalev and says, no, you all passed away. So they don't even have that extra protection. And that's what I think really is happening in the comment that Rashi makes. If you go back to this comment that Rashi talks about, when he says, when the Jewish people are being quoted as, and the Jewish people answer, What's happening there? Hashem gives and takes away and gives to other people how. Then Amban expands on this comment. And he says, look at the book of Bereshit. You have a very simple thing. Whoever sins, the punishment of sin in the eyes of God is in exile. So we have Adam sins, Adam gets exiled from Gan Aiden. We have Cain who sins, Cain gets exiled as well. And he's Navanati Yebaaretz. We have the generation of the Tower sins, Hashem exiles them as well. The one Hamabul sins, Hashem exiles them this time they get exiled so bad, they get flooded away completely. But we see the general concept that you sin you lose privileges on this earth. It's a universal sense of justice that God is beholding to all of mankind. And the Jewish people happen to find themselves at a kind of the right moment in history when one's judgment is up and therefore they can now move in to a new place. This when did has, Rabbi? Yeah. When did ha- when did Hashem tell the uh, Ameha Aretz that they would be expelled if they behaved in this fashion? Okay, so it's a good question. Here, it it definitely helps if you have Adam and you have Noah. What do I mean by that? Meaning, if we have people, uh, according to Hazal, the Sheva Mitzvot and Noah come from Adam himself. The basic way of behavior that exist in this world. And therefore, there are people who are capable of passing down, of being, we'll call them, if you will, moral guides to the future generations. Whether it's it. Adam or Noah, what? It. Right, whether it's Adam or Noah or any other type of person. Now, then they tell them the stories that exist. The stories are part of the national, or oh, the whatever you're talking about, conscious of the people at the time. That God responds, God cares about your actions, and your actions are going to have ramifications of exile. That, I think, is the basic stories of the Torah telling us that. But later on, we see something interesting. Later on, most famous in the story of Yonah, we have a similar concept that what happens in the story of Yonah, God actually directly sends his prophet to the city in order to tell them that on Arba'im Yom, right? it's, going to be, it's going to be very shortly, and it's going to get overturned. So be, be very careful about that, he tells the people. And then all of a sudden, they go and they change their ways. Okay. So here, here, here is something interesting, I think, also, that Hashem kind of tells them specifically in Perek Vav of the book of Devari, where he's talking about the Jewish people entering the land, and he tells them, 
that Hashem is bringing you into the land, he's very, he's very clear about the Jewish people, about their relationship. He's saying, Hashem loves you, Shomrot is Shivu'ah, and therefore you have to keep the mitzvot. We'll get rid of them. If you're not following his word, and you become a sunnah of God, then God will get rid of you, and that's a, a crouch within the prohibition of Abu Dazara and not following the ways of the people of the land. He does it one more time, where he says, don't think you're a sadiq, don't think you're righteous. That way it's a tirikteh, right? Besibkati hevi ani Hashem lareshet et ha'aretz hazot. Don't think you're better and more righteous than these people, but rather, Their time was up. Yeah, it could have been you, it could have been anybody else. It's, it's, it doesn't necessarily mean you did something special that you inherited the land. This message, I think, is very important for us to understand, especially when we read Parashat Shelach Lecha, where it's this manifest destiny of the people inheriting the land. You look elsewhere in the Torah, you see the same message in different books of the Torah, in Vayikra, in Bereshi, in Devarim. The people of the land were losing it. It has nothing to do with the Jews because they sinned. There was a sense of justice. They were deserving of the actions to happen to them. And the Jewish people, this happened to be the next people. And Hashem is setting them up and giving them the capability of succeeding in the land. But as we know, eventually the Jewish people are also going to get kicked out of the land. They're going to be exiled as well. This idea, I think, is important for us to understand, especially in today's times, because it lays a framework of understanding that God's justice is a universal justice as opposed to a justice that's specific to only the Jewish people. When you create a system in which you talk about the Jewish people uh, deserving, they are God's people, and almost everybody else is automatically not worthy, so then people will feel and think, okay, we're entitled to certain things, we're inherently great, it doesn't matter what we do, how we behave, how we act, we automatically deserve these things. As opposed to when you read the Torah, what the Torah is trying to tell you, we're not any different than anybody else. It's the other people failed, and now God is choosing you. And he, had, he made a shiva of your forefathers. When the other people failed, and not a moment earlier, then he'd bring it into the land. And he'd give you a try. But you could get kicked out just like them. And indeed that happens within the Jewish history. That's a very really sovereign statement of facing the reality of the Jewish people. If you want to talk about a sense of entitlement, it really, the Torah going out of its way to wash it away, God's sense of justice is universal in the sense. And I think that's something to, to think about, especially in today's times when we're, we're talking about social justice in the world and the role of Jewish people participating within these demands for justice, it's important for Jewish people to realize what that concept means, especially in God's times from the Torah. That's number one. The, the, the second thing I want to I wanna just focus about is something I think uh, this that related to the topic, and that is besides an uh, whole ideally and you know what we just said is not the correct reason why people are hesitant within a Jewish communities to participate and think about the concept of social justice within uh, specifically the Orthodox Jewish community. What else might be causing some form of hesitation of Jewish people kind of speaking out and being more active within these types of movements. Meaning, it should be, if you go to, for instance, the Liberty Bell, and you go and you see a pasuk from the Torah, you shall proclaim liberty throughout the, throughout the land, 
that's the pasuk they have from uh, Parashat Behan on the Liberty Belt, which is establishing the ideas of freedom, of equality within the United States of America. It's inspired by the Torah. You would think that Jews shouldn't naturally be inclined to any further promotion of these ideas of universal justice and end of racism. Jews should, this is something that the Jewish people should have a natural affiliation with, a natural affinity with, and it's a development of ideas contained within the Torah. But I'm, I'm going to identify two things. There's probably a lot more. Uh, let's mention two things that I think are relevant for why we might have that hesitant uh, sense of jumping in oftentimes. And it's important to be aware of them because sometimes it is applicable and it does make sense, and sometimes it's not, and perhaps there's something different to be done. That is number one, especially over the past 20, 30 years, really one could argue even going back longer, the speaking of equality and movements of social justice have seemed to take on a new life of their own and that very much borders, if not overtly, then you know, a little bit under under the surface of anti-Semitism crouched within anti-Zionism, as it always the same, not necessarily, but oftentimes that definitely seems to be, to the point where there was actually a Hillel Yeshiva graduate who sued NYU and actually created some form of presidential order and was on the stage with President Trump about these issues. And a lot has been said in the past couple of years, uh, Barry Weiss writing in the New York Times about the rise of anti-Semitism on the left. So there's a sense of hesitancy when we talk about these social justice movements, because oftentimes they don't seem to be so just, but rather they seem to be coming after Jewish people. So that's one thing I think that the Jewish people have been to use the word almost burned by these movements in the past, that's automatically going to give them some pause when they see a movement like that in the future. So I think that's something significant. It's something that we have to ask ourselves, is, does that exist now? Is this what we're talking about in today's current climate? We always have to kind of have that view. What exactly am I signing up for? And it's a good question, but I'm, I'm, I'm not necessarily sure it's relevant to you, but that I, I would say people can make their own decisions. I think it's something that goes within the natural process of somebody's head. But then the s- second thing that I think exists is something more interesting. As Jews, and I think this is universal to all Amer- the Jewish American experience, we're very appreciative of the civil institutions that exist within the United States of America. For a large part, the civil institutions that exist have benefited American Jewry a great deal. It's very natural for us to feel comforted by the presence of police as opposed to the opposite, feeling threatened. Normally the threat for Jewish people comes from elsewhere and the police are the ones who arrive to protect the interests of the Jewish people. We have very good working relationships with them, but really it goes throughout anyone who comes from other countries in which the state itself was perpetrating acts of anti-Semitism against the Jewish people. America is this big sigh of relief that all of a sudden not only is the state neutral, but they're actually supportive and protecting the life rights of the citizens, Jewish people included. And when you have a protest, and specifically a protest against the institutions of the state, so in this situation, the police, and we can argue, is it actually a protest against the police or against specific behavior of some policemen and the greater issues of racism? But at the end of the day, there's definitely the sense that we are protesting the institution as is, and definitely the cries amongst the protesters who protest the institution of the police. And we're hearing all these different things of, 
and defunding the police and the nice and the and the like, that's going to give Jewish people pause about their participation within these movements because of their affinity towards these institutions that generally work for Jewish people as a minority within the country. It's something that's that's really odd as because really the stories diverge completely. For one minority, the institution that's completely is not working. And for the other, it's a great story of really success for the other, especially comparing themselves to the other experiences they have in history. So it's something very, I think there might be a couple of more reasons as well, but it's something very interesting as, a, as an American Jew to find oneself and the desire to have this see American society reach a greater sense of justice, to allow the sense of liberty to be fully realized in a deeper way. But yet at the same time, to ask them to a worry about where these where the true intentions of these things are going, and also to express support and appreciation for the institutions that do exist. It's a very funny, I think, it's a very funny situation for us as Jews to be in. There's this awkward sense of trying to fit in into multiple places at the same time. So I just mentioned that as a, as a continuation of this idea that we saw within the parasha. If we're talking about God's universal justice and it's and they're not discriminatory towards Jewish people, not Jewish people, that's obviously something very clear that we would want to be emulated within society as well. How, how that goes about, one goes about that as an American group could be a more complicated uh, situation in reality, but I think it's definitely something that we have to wrestle with in some way, we have to think about it in some way, ask ourselves what makes sense for us to do, what does it make sense for us to do, and how, how to try to be part of this conversation about the universal sense of liberty within taking place within our country. And hopefully it's a conversation and not anything else, but yeah. So we'll, we'll pause here for today, but if anyone has thoughts, I'd be definitely happy to, to hear if anyone has any thoughts about that.